James Strong's 1890 exhaustive concordance of the Bible arranged all the words of the King James Version alphabetically, so you could find any Bible passage by looking for a key word. It also tied each entry to the Hebrew and Greek in a way that makes them accessible to English readers. There was and is nothing wrong with all that. It required an immense amount of minute labor during a time before computers. I am in awe. But judging solely by my personal experience in social media debates with Christians, which is probably more extensive than it ought to be, Strong's isn't just used as a concordance because it's free and also perhaps because it doesn't cost any money. It has become the dictionary for those wishing to find the true meaning of the Hebrew and Greek words of scripture. Here are three reasons why that's not so great and one set of brief suggestions on what Bible study resources to use instead. First, in my experience, Nobody bothers to read the fine print to discover what exactly Strong was trying to do in his entries. Through no fault of his own, except perhaps naive trust that people might actually read the fine print, Strong's entries therefore sometimes lend themselves to abuses. Just the other day, a Christian said to another Christian online, where else? Most English speaking believers don't know the true meaning of the words in their Bible. When you read the word trust in English, he said, you may not realize that in Hebrew and Greek, what it really means is believe, trust, place trust in, rely, confide, to entrust, especially one's spiritual well being to Christ. He was, of course, quoting Strong's dictionary, and in this case, mixing up entries from two or more Hebrew and Greek words. But if you read Strong's intro, you'll understand that Strong isn't saying that believe and trust and put in trust with add up to a definition of the Hebrew and Greek words for trust in the Bible. They are instead what's called glosses, single word translation equivalents drawn in this case straight from the King James. Some of these glosses fit in only particular contexts. They're not a menu from which you can select whichever meaning appeals to you. They're not a soup either of all those meanings mixed together that you can then pour into yet other Bible passages. This is a second reason you should probably replace Strong's Dictionary in your Bible study. People love to make meaning soup with Strong's. Take the definition I quoted earlier from social media. It just doesn't work. The Greek word for trust clearly does not always mean to entrust one's spiritual well-being to Christ. How do we know this? Because the demons believe, same Greek word, and they even tremble in fear at God's power, James 2.19. But they haven't entrusted themselves to Jesus. Likewise, King Agrippa, who refused Paul's gospel, nonetheless, Paul said, believed, same word, the prophets, Acts 26.27. Dictionaries like Strong's came along at a time when linguists were perhaps less sensitive to the problem I'm pointing to. These reference works tend to invite Bible readers to load up Bible words with more meaning than the Spirit intended. Context, not hidden Hebrew and Greek meanings, tells you what level or quality or object of belief is meant by the word trust. Third, strong sometimes leads unwary readers straight into word study fallacies. For example, under the simple common New Testament Greek word agaliao, you get this. There's the word in Greek letters, now, how many users of Strong's will find this helpful? There it is in English letters, that's better, and with a simple pronunciation guide, also better. But it doesn't actually help most English Bible readers to know that the word originally came from agon, meaning much. Etymologies are not reliable guides to word meaning. Words mean what they are used to mean at a given time, not necessarily what they used to mean. And yet we're told faithfully that this word also comes from Strong's number 242, which is the word holomai, meaning to jump. Strong's says the Greek word it's defining here properly means to jump for joy, but that overdoes it by a good bit. Strong's own numbering system will show you the places where this word for rejoice occurs. And if you look through them, you'll sense quickly that the word just can't mean jump for joy. Again, not everywhere. For example, Mary uses the word in the beautiful Magnificat when she says, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Jumping for joy is something you do when you are suddenly ecstatic, not something you do when you are quietly smiling to yourself about something special that you alone know on all the planet. The Greek word here does not mean jump for joy. It means 
rejoices, which you already knew because you can read your English Bible. Honestly, my first replacement for Strong's is that you stick with English. There are so many great Bible dictionaries and commentaries that use only the language you apparently already know. I love Hebrew and Greek, the original languages of scripture, but you don't truly have to know them to know God. Use multiple good English Bible translations, gain some sense for why they differ, and you may actually do better than someone who likes to ride the sacred cow of original language usage through the slaughterhouse of linguistic fallacies. But if you can rein yourself in, indeed perhaps with some help from D.A. Carson's excellent little book, Exegetical Fallacies, it is possible to gain insight from Hebrew and Greek without knowing these languages and at the risk of sounding like a salesman, I'm gonna show you the tools I use. I, of course, use Logos Bible software. I right-click on interesting words in English Bibles, and I run Bible word studies on the original language terms underlying them. You don't have to know anything other than English to do this. And what you get is not only a concordance that is more powerful and rapid than Strong's, but you get access to whatever original language dictionaries you own. BDAG, Bauer, Donker, Arndt, and Gingrich, is the top Greek English dictionary or lexicon. Its definitions are sentence length descriptions, not merely one word glosses. For example, for the first sense of that same simple Greek word for trust, it offers this definition to consider something to be true and therefore worthy of one's trust. That's a restrained, careful description that actually fits the contexts in which the word gets used. And BDAG gives four other senses that are equally careful, along with various example passages in which they appear. Reliable resources don't dunk you into a meaning soup. They give you some guidance on which sense of a word might be present in a given biblical context. I also use Lonida and Swanson in Logos. Both use semantic domains to arrange meaning into categories in a way that helps you place synonyms off each other. The Lexham Theological Word Book is also worth a look because it carefully distinguishes the different kinds of contexts in which important words get used. Reliable resources aren't as exciting, maybe, as meaning soup. They may not always give you mic drop moments on social media, but they will help you gain a simple, solid understanding of God's Word.